The topic for this week is functional connectivity. Um, functional connectivity is one of the main approach for the brain network analysis. So today we are going to uh, spend one or two hours to focus on this topic. And again, please visit my website and focus on the uh, today, week 11. Please download the handout and the materials from the uh, links. And the software that we are going to use in uh, this class is actually the SPN12 as well as the DPAVI. So if you did uh, attend the class for the I think last two weeks, I think the week week nine, then you uh, probably already have the SPN12 and the DPAVI uh, installed in your computer or included the path in the manual environment. So that will be fine. You don't re really need to do anything else. Just use the DPAVI and the SPN12 today. And again, I may uh, remind you that uh, because the PABI includes the SPN12, lots of functions are uh, from the SPN12. So the uh, requirement for the file name and file path that uh, no Chinese character or space uh, should be avoided within the file path or file name. Or you may see some error for the uh, file import or load files problem. OK, so again, this is the uh, roadmap for this class. Now we again focused on the brain connectivity or brain network analysis. And I may remind you that the function connectivity is actually one of the approach that measure the dependencies or the similarity between both signals. Of course, these both signals should uh, acquired or extracted from different brain uh, region or brain locations. So we can uh, use the functional connectivity approach to estimate uh, the dependencies or similarities between uh, these both signals. Okay. And again, I uh, left all the parameters in slide five. You can just check all the parameters right here. Uh, for this uh, for this course today, specifically, you should uh, remember the TR repetition time is two thousand millisecond or for the dependency to a box, actually, they use the unit of second, so it should be two seconds right here. Another thing you should know is the file number or the uh, time frames. Uh, for our data set, uh, we use the racing state, FMI data set right here. The original file number is 200. However, we actually will, we will exclude the first 10 time points because of the uh, unstable uh, MI signal. So normally we will exclude the first 10 time point right here. So the actual um, follow numbers for the subsequent analysis, specifically for the functional connectivity analysis, is 190. Okay, 190 uh, follows. Okay, so this is two parameters that you should uh, remember today. So come to the first part, we will talk about uh, what is the basic idea, what, what is the principles behind the functional connectivity of FMI. You can also apply this functional connectivity approach for several different approaches, such as the EG, um, EG, MEG, or the FNIRS. You may have heard this technique before, or maybe, maybe not. But the FNIRS, functional near uh, infrared space spectroscopy, is another approach that you can measure the blood oxygenation level uh, in vivo. You can actually perform this kind of functional connectivity if you have temporal profiles or temporal signals on hand. Then you can measure this kind of the dependence between uh, these, these several different uh, temporal signals. Okay. So functional continuity is very handy and very useful for most of the uh, temporal signal analysis. Today we focus on FMI, but just remember that you can always use the functional connectivity for other types of the signal. So again, we display this slide, and the function connectivity may be listed as, uh, listed as one of the model free or data driven analysis. So we talked about the GLM, that is one of the model mass analysis. Then we talked about the ALFF reho and uh, as well as the ICA that we talked in the last week. They all belong to the um, model free analysis approach right here. And today, functional connectivity analysis is again one of the uh, model free analysis approach because we don't really need any prior information about how we deliver the 
uh, experiment to this object. We don't, we don't really need to know how many blocks that we actually have on hand. We only need the data. And uh, that is why this approach is called a data-driven approach. So you can see, uh, you can, again, you can use the task-specific fMRI that may be uh, designed by the block design or even the event-related design. Or you can have the racing state fMRI. That means objects that didn't do anything uh, within the uh, scanner. So either way, if you have this kind of a temporal data, we call it API data set, then you can use the function conjugate analysis to do the, uh, to do the subsequent analysis right here. So this is the list. Today we focus on this one. We have talked about this part and this part. And now we are going to talk about this part. Functional continuous analysis, specifically, we will use one of the linear correlation approach. Okay, I think this is the most common and uh, widely used approach, linear correlation, between two temporal signals. And sometimes you can also apply this kind of a linear correlation between two um, frequential profile. That means the temporal profile can be uh, can be transformed to the frequency domain using the Fourier transform. And uh, based on this kind of the uh, frequential spectrum, you can also use a linear correlation based on these this kind of things. Sometimes we may call this kind of approach as the linear coherence. You may heard this term before that. But linear coherence is actually estimate the linear correlation in the frequency domain. But today we still focus on the temporal domain. That is the linear correlation or the common uh, function connectivity approach. <coughs> and uh, we already introduced this paper before that actually published in MRM, Magnetic Resonance in Medicine, this journal, in 1995 uh, from this group, the uh, Professor Biswal. They uh, they actually found that the functional connectivity between the brain regions in the uh, or during the resting state fMRI that can actually mapping to the actually the motor task fMRI. You can find this very similar result using the functional connectivity analysis. So sometimes we may uh, say uh, FC for the functional connectivity in short. Okay. And you can see right here, we say functional connectivity or FC is defined as the statistical association or dependency among two or more uh, distinct time series. Of course, this distinct time series normally uh, come from different anatomic location. So you can see uh, for this example in the left hand side, that we can actually depict the two ROI, ROI represent region of interest. We can depict the two region of interest right here. It's maybe some circular or spherical uh, ROI right here. And for um, these two different regions, you can uh, see the corresponding average signal from these two ROIs. Okay, you can see the blue curves for this one, the red curves for this one. So actually these uh, these are the regions uh, covering a bilateral primary motor area right here. So you can see uh, blue for the left motor, uh, red for the right motor signals right here. So now you can um, you can do the visual inspection. You may say, yeah, maybe the signals or the bold signals from left and the right motor area uh, looks pretty similar with each other. But uh, how can you quantify the similarity? How can you say uh, how large or how much this kind of a similarity is? You definitely need some kind of the uh, statistical approach. So today, we may introduce this uh, Pearson correlation coefficient. I think this is uh, one of the common approach that we will use. And another example is if, if you are focused on the, if you are focusing on the racing state fMRI, and we already introduced this famous network, deformal network, or DMN in short. This um, deformal network actually uh, is composed of several different brain regions, including this one. This one is the, uh, in short, MPFC, medial prefrontal cortex, right here. And uh, this one, it should be more deeper one, uh, is the PCC, posterior cingulate cortex. And uh, you also include this one, the uh, cyan blue right here. This is actually the superior parietal region right here. And this blue uh, region is the imperial temporal gyrus. These several regions actually um, become, combined with all of them, become the DMN network right here. Uh, DMN, okay. 
So you can see if again we extract all the average both signals from these four different RIs, you can again see that the temporal profile again looks pretty like it with each other. So how can we quantify the similarity again we suffer the same issue right here? However, you can see when we say network is normally defined as that uh, different components may exhibit uh, similar temporal profiles right here. So now uh, the functional continuity is actually with the goal to quantify the similarity between these different both signals right here. So we can actually claim that with high functional continuity, maybe different brain regions can become or can uh, form so-called network right here. So ne a motor network or the DMN right here. And uh, to define so-called the brain region, you can either use the RI, just we showed before, you can just put a, a cervical region. You can, uh, you can determine the center of the severe, maybe in some kind of a location. But another approach, uh, maybe more elegant way or more efficient way, is to determine brain regions based on the atlas. And this one, AAL, is one of the atlas that we introduced in, I think, in week four, when we talk about the uh, brain anatomy. AAL is actually, I think the full name is the Automatic uh, Anatomical Labeling, okay, in short, AAL. AAL atlas, I think, they have two different forms, one for uh, 90 brain regions, another one is for 116. Uh, regions. So sometimes we say AL90, that means 90 regions. AL116, that means they postulate or they separate the brain into 116 different brain regions. Okay. And this kind of the AL atlas is actually delineated uh, for the MNI, MNI template. MNI template is, I think, currently the most popular and the most famous one. Uh, worldwide. So people doing the uh, neural imaging study will uh, always know what is the MNI. It's kind of the standard standard coordinates for the brain. So as you, you may recall that we actually introduced one of the important steps called normalize or normalization. We actually normalize uh, each participant's brain into a standard uh, uh, coordinate or into a standard space that we call MNI. Okay. So MNI uh, coordinate, if you have this kind of a standard coordinate on hand, you can actually depict uh, different brain regions, of course, by some expert of the brain anatomy, but you can depict these uh, different brain regions on this kind of a standard coordinate. Then if you have uh, individual brain, you just what you need to do is just normalize this brain into this standard coordinate. Then you can directly apply or overlap this kind of the uh, predefined atlas on subject normalized brain. Then you can extract the different brain regions based on this kind of atlas. Uh, if you use this kind of procedure, actually you can save a lot of labor intensive work right there because actually you can easily using the overlapping uh, process, then you can extract 116 different brain regions. That will be easier and uh, it actually can reduce the bias that uh, every single time you need to put the cervical RI by hands, that may cause some bias. So you, with this kind of the standard atlas, for example, the AAL atlas, then you can uh, actually do this kind of the regional signal extraction very efficiently and with less uh, manual bias right there. Okay, so this is actually the procedure. You definitely need the individual anatomy or individual T1 weighting imaging. And after the normalization, you can ensure that now the individual anatomy actually match the standard space, that is the MNI space right here. So what you need to do is to overlap the predefined MNI atlas, for example, AL, until the subjects normalize the brain right here. And of course, we only focus on the brain matter region. So if you may recall that with the uh, segment step or segmentation step, you can extract three, at least three different uh, tissue probability map, C1, C2, and C3 uh, for uh, gray matter, white matter, and the CSF uh, respectively. So normally we will focus on this one, gray matter or C1 map because the most of the neural cells are located in gray matter region. So for the CSF and the white matter, we normally ignore 
the signal from then, or normally we don't really uh, believe that brain activation is come from the CSF or come from the Huan Mei So what we are going to do is we actually over the this kind of the MNI standard atlas on gray matter regions. So now what we can have is this one. Maybe I can enlarge the pictures right here. So you can see overlapped the predefined atlas right here with the subjects normalized anatomic image right here and specifically focus on the gray matter. Now you can see we can label different gray matter with different uh, color right here. So different color means that they are actually different or distinct anatomical regions within the brain. So you can see bilateral solomon's region right here or bilateral insular regions right here, putamen, caudate, you can just uh, uh, match this kind of imaging template with what you learned from the uh, brain anatomy or neuro neural anatomy right there. Okay. So this is one of the uh, very important approach. If you want to uh, actually create a large scale functional network, for example, you want to actually consider the functional connectivity between a hundred <laughs> brain regions. You definitely don't want to put the RI <laughs> one by one because you need to create a hundred RI manually. It's kind of the crazy job for you. So what you need to do is use the AL atlas. And of course, AL is not the only one atlas. Today, uh, you can actually download, I think, over 10 different atlas based on different definition. For example, the earliest one is the Broman, Broman atlas. That is actually um, defined based on the histology, histology uh, architectures. And then I think there is a modified version called the Jubran. It is actually similar, uh, defined as the histological basis. But AL is one of the uh, functional basis, and actually uh, parcelates brain region into different area. For example, the motor area, or sometimes they call the precentral area, postcentral area, mostly based on the uh, functions of the brain regions. Okay, so for the motor area, primary motor area, they have labeled by one and two called bilateral. Uh, Precentral or bilateral primary motor area. But for the cemental sensory area, that is actually uh, named as the post central, post central gyrus. So for the cemental sensory area. So you can actually uh, see the AL is defined by uh, functions, functions of the brain. Okay, and then once you have the OI on hand, no matter. Uh, defined by manual, manual or uh, defined based on the predefined uh, uh, atlas, then you can you may perform the uh, functional computer analysis. However, uh, in this slide, uh, I may uh, remind you that there are several different key steps for functional computer analysis. For the first one is the uh, essential uh, fMRI preprocessing. Actually, all the uh, common fMRI processing steps should be applied before you perform any functional connectivity. So slice timing, realignment, segmentation, normalization, smooth, and even the bias correction. I would recommend you to include all the necessary steps for the functional connectivity analysis. And then followed by the uh, point 0.2 to, to point 0.5 right here, I think these are the uh, common approach or necessary approach for the functional connectivity analysis. The second bullet right here is the regression. But uh, this regression is actually not uh, with the same goal for the GLM. This regression is actually to remove remove the nuisance uh, covariance from the, uh, normally from the physiological noise. So you may see that we, we will use the average signal from the white matter and the CSF. Because, for example, for the CSF, they may contain uh, huge single component actually from the respiration. That is uh, one of the uh, physiological noise that we don't want to incorporate into our functional cognitive analysis. And another thing is the white meter because we tend to believe that the most brain activation is from gray meter. So we may use the white meter as another coherence to remove out. Okay. And uh, another thing is the global main signal. This is actually the optional step. People right now um, actually separate into two different groups. One group uh, tend to believe that regress out the global mean signal is necessary. 
However, another group may claim that removal of the global mean signal may cause uh, some reduced correlation between uh, brain regions because the global mean signal actually also include the gray matter signals. So now people, uh, part of the people may say that actually you only need to regress out the white matter and CCF. That's enough. You don't really need to remove out the signal from the global average. Okay. So actually in the PEPI toolbox that we use today, uh, you can actually select the option whether you want to uh, include the regression for these two regions or you you you'd also like to include the regression uh, for the uh, global mean signal. You can just select this one. However, um, in the pre-setup um, pipeline that I provide to you today is actually only include these two signal, point meter and CSF. I didn't include the global mean uh, regression right here. Okay, so this step uh, regress out the nuisance conference with the goal to actually remove or eliminate the possible uh, interference from the physiological signals, for example, the heart rate or for example, the uh, respiratory signals or something else. Okay, so this is the key step that I definitely need to do right here. <coughs> and the third point right here is the signal filtering. And uh, I think I, I have mentioned this uh, when we talk about the ALFF, that we actually believe the brain activation or brain activity of course, for FMI, is actually the uh, vascular response. Most, mostly uh, content within this frequency band, between point, uh, point zero 0.01 and uh, point 0.1 hertz right here. Sometimes people may say uh, point zero 0.01 to uh, maybe point zero 0.08 hertz. Okay, I think that's uh, slightly different between uh, these two setups, but I think it's okay. So, single filtering is another essential step for functional connectivity because if you include higher frequency band right here you may easily you may easily uh, contaminate contaminate your signal by the physiological signal for example uh, 0.2 hertz is actually the respiratory uh, period and uh, for the I think 1 to 1.5 hertz is actually the cardiac cycle and uh, I think the signal around 0.1 we also have another physiological uh, uh, signal called male wave that is uh, actually uh, correlated to the I think blood pressure or some response from the uh, vascular muscle or vascular wall. Okay, so I think this this signal uh, this frequency band uh, is very important and most of the brain activation or function connectivity should be extracted from this frequency band. So signal filtering, specifically the band pass filter is very important. You may exclude the high frequency band right here. And for the low frequency band, I mean the frequency below the point uh, zero 0.01 is actually uh, some low frequency drifting within the FMI signal right here. So we will also exclude this kind of the low signal drifting right there. We only preserve the signal from this frequency band. So this is it, the band pass filter right here. Okay. And then the following step is the uh, correction coefficient. Again, this is one of the statistical approach that we can actually quantify the similarity or dependencies between two uh, body signals right here. And uh, Pearson's correlation coefficient is the currently the most famous one because this is a very effective approach to estimate the linear correlation right here. And of course, if you just trying to search the literature, you may find out there are uh, several different nonlinear approach to measure the correlation. For example, mutual information is another example. However, I think the widely used one is the this one, Pearson correlation coefficient. And sometimes you may uh, hear another, I think another modified method called partial correlation coefficient. That means uh, they actually calculate the linear correlation, but with the potential uh, removal of the covariance signal. For example, if you try to estimate the um, similarity between region A and region B, you may calculate the Pearson correlation coefficients. But in some scenario, you may believe that maybe there is some uh, signal from the region C 
it may be some kind of the moderator or some I don't know some intermediate state that region C may affect both region A and region B. Then if you, you, you are aiming to actually extract the direct correlation between A and B, you may use the region C as the covariate. So in this kind of a scenario, you may use the partial correlation coefficient to estimate the direct correlation between A and B. But uh, that is uh, one of the particular uh, scenario, but not the scenario that we normally uh, consider about. So today we only use the Pearson correlation coefficient right here. Okay. The final step is the uh, Z transform right here, and uh, we say feature R to Z transform. What is R? R is actually the Pearson correlation coefficient. We normally use the R to represent these coefficients right here. However, uh, the normal distribution of the Pearson correlation coefficient is between minus 1 to 1 right here. So either minus 1 or 1 represent the high correlation, but with the positive sign for the uh, positive correlation, for the negative sign for the negative correlation. Or sometimes we may say they have the phase difference between two signals, but a similar profile with the phase uh, difference, then you may have the uh, minus 1 correlation coefficient right here. However, for most of the um, statistical uh, examination, they may require uh, the basic assumption that the samples or the, 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 the value should be uh, follow the normal distribution right there. So feature R to Z transform is actually to transform all the R value or R coefficient derived from the Pearson correlation analysis to a normal distribution. So this Z is actually the z-score that we introduced in the last week. Z-score is the way that we can measure the difference from uh, the difference from the mean value uh, in a unit of the estimate deviation right there. So this is a Z value. Okay. So with this final step, you may easier to uh, compare the signal from different uh, subjects or perform the group-wise the analysis right there. So this is, this, uh, these are the five key steps that we are going to do today. But of course, we don't really need to, um, to, to do coding on the Meta environment because we have the Depappy to us. You can actually use the GUI to set up all the parameters for each step. Then you can just click the button and wait a couple of minutes to see the result. Okay. And um, I think for the uh, final slide in the first part, you may... Um, try to remember that we have several different terms for the uh, functional connectivity analysis. First uh, things, we may uh, categorize the functional connectivity based on how you define the RIs. So first, the category should be the seed-based ROI. So seed-based means that you, uh, you will give a small ROI. Normally, we will define this kind of seed-based ROI uh, manually. So we may set up a specific a specific MNI coordinates uh, for a specific brain region. For example, we take the uh, posterior cingular cortex as an example. This is the standard coordinates for the PCC. So if you already finished the normalization for the individual uh, T1 weighted imaging, then you can just key in this coordinate, then it will locate it on this kind of the uh, place that actually is the posterior cingular cortex. And then we will use this coordinate as the center, but we will uh, open a cervical area with a uh, 6 millimeter radius. I think 6 or 8 millimeter is a common value that we use to create this kind of the cervical region. Okay, 6 or 8. And another a type is the atlas based RI. So you can easily imagine why they call this name because you define all the RI based on one of the atlas, AL Roman or some Harvard atlas or some uh, John Hopkins atlas. I think there are plenty of different uh, atlas at the, on hand you can do. Okay, so this is actually uh, the different terms for uh, different definition of the RIs. And another two uh, terms that you may see later is the functional connectivity maps or functional connectivity metrics. So I want to use these figures to uh, let you easily understand what is a maps. You can see right here, when we say functional connectivity maps, is actually the distribution of the high similarity regions on the brain image right here. So we say this is the maps, because I can see if 
the PCC is the city point right here. I can easily to see that the region with the red or the hot colors right here represent they have the high correlation coefficients with the seed points right here. So I may say if I am using the racing state data set and I put the PCC as a seed ROI, then with this kind of the functional continuity maps, you can easily say that the supra or the, uh, the su uh, supra parietal regions as well as the medial prefrontal regions are highly correlated to this species region. So FZ maps is actually one of the common way that we try to display or try to show the uh, correlation coefficients uh, based on the anatomical location right here. Okay, so this is the so-called FZ maps right here. <coughs> and this one is a functional continuity matrix. Imagine if you now have the uh, 116 different RIs on hand. What you can do is actually you can estimate the correlation among any pair of these uh, 116 regions right here. So you can actually uh, construct a 116 by 116 matrix right here. For each row, there's actually uh, one of the uh, brain regions right here. And for each column, again, for one of the brain regions right here. What I can see right here for a specific location, for example, row 20 uh, and uh, maybe column 60 right here. That means this specific uh, value uh, right here is the correlation coefficient between region 20 and uh, between uh, uh, between region 20 and uh, region 60 right here. So you can actually construct this kind of the matrix to represent the whole brand, whole brand correlation coefficient uh, based on the atlas based ROI right here. So of course you can use the uh, manual define ROI. For example, you can manually define maybe 10 different ROIs or 10 different C points right here. You can also construct a, a 10 by 10 correlation uh, matrix or functional connectivity matrix right here. You can also do so. Okay. So either way, normally if we want to uh, observe or to understand the anatomical location, we will use them. FC maps right here. But if, you, if we want to construct a complex network, normally we will use the FC matrix right here. So it's a two different uh, representation for the functional connectivity. Okay.